all know I want to let you all know that um, recording of this event, whether it be in person or on a computer screen, may not be used without the express written approval of the League. The League will only allow audio video of this event to be broadcast in its entirety, except um, by the media reporting on the event. A recording will be made available to the, to the public on our website after tonight's meeting. As is our tradition, the League of Women Voters of Salt Lake would like to formally begin this event by acknowledging that we are meeting tonight on indigenous land, originally inhabited and nurtured by the Ute, Goshut, Shoshone, Paiute, and Navajo people. We honor their stewardship and pledge to follow in their footsteps with ongoing efforts to treat this space and the land we inhabit here with reverence and respect. I'm Shauna Bona, President-Elect of the League of Women Voters of Salt Lake, and I'll be your moderator this evening. So our format tonight is going to be simple. We hope for a free-flowing educational conversation, not a debate. And we've gathered four questions from our membership, which we're going to give to each of the panelists and have them have an opportunity to answer. And then we're going to turn to our audience for their questions. So to make sure we have plenty of time for that, we'd like to ask each of our panelists to Try your best to keep your answers as succinct as you can with the understanding that, you know, you're here to educate us, so you might need a little time, but do your best so that we have time for our audience. And for the audience, please submit your questions through the Q&A function in your Zoom window. And even though our panelists can see those questions, we want them to focus on what we're our current questions. So rather than having them scan those, we're going to hold them. And we've asked Donnie Davis, Program Director for the League of Women Voters of Salt Lake, to monitor that Q&A. And she's going to ask as many questions as possible on behalf of the audience when we reach that place in our format tonight, which will be around 8 o'clock. So with that, I would like to introduce our panel and to thank all four, all four of you so much for being here with us. Um, so let me just get started and say that Gordon Haight, formerly Assistant City Manager of Harriman City, was named Executive Director of the Utah Independent Redistricting Committee in May 2021. The Utah Independent Redistricting Commission was created through the 2018 passage of Proposition 4 and was then modified through compromise legislation called SB 200 in 2020. The result was an independent advisory commission that enhances the public's voice in the redistricting process. The commission is a bipartisan group of seven commissioners appointed by both Democratic and Republican leaders with the chair appointed by the Utah's governor, by Utah's governor. To avoid conflicts of interest, Commissioners cannot be lobbyists, cannot be elected officials, party leaders, or executive appointees. The commission's job is to recommend maps of congressional, state senate, state house, and state school board districts for final consideration by the legislature. The commission will prepare three plans for each type of map. In preparing its maps, the commission is seeking public input on the maps, including what people in Utah consider communities of interest. Once the commission submits the plans, the Legislative Redistricting Committee will have a public hearing dedicated to reviewing the commission's map at maps and taking public comment. The legislature may then adopt a proposed plan or it may choose final maps of its own. Karen Hale has worked to support and strengthen communities through her involvement in municipal, county, and state government and community organizations. Karen was director of special initiatives for Salt Lake County Mayor Jenny Wilson and under Mayor Ben McAdams served as the state county, Salt Lake County Deputy Mayor for Community and External Affairs. Prior to her work at the county, Karen served as director of community relations and communications director to Salt Lake City Mayor Ralph Becker. Elected to the Utah State Senate in 1998, Karen was a steady, passionate voice for public and higher education and the safety and health of Utah families. She's actively engaged in the community through participation on boards that include Intermountain Healthcare, Primary Children's Hospital Foundation, the Natural History Museum of Utah, and the Utah Film Center. She served as co-chair of the Utah Debate Commission, a nonpartisan, independent sponsor of debates for qualified candidates for statewide and federal offices. Karen is the former publisher and editor of Parent Express, a news and resource magazine for Utah families. She and her husband, John, are the parents of five children and grandparents to 10 wonderfully spirited grandchildren. 
Lyle Hilliard, advises clients in the areas of family law and criminal defense. He is also a skilled mediator with specialized training in mediation. Hilliard has practiced law for over 50 years and has served for over 40 years in the Utah State Legislature. He was a member of the Utah Senate from 1985 to 2020, serving as the Senate Majority Leader and President of the Senate, as well as co-chair of the Joint Executive Appropriations Committee. Hilliard is also a Utah Commissioner for Uniform Laws. He has served as legal as he has served the legal community and the public in a variety of capacities in committee memberships, board involvements, and community activities. He is a member of the executive board of the Cache Valley Council and now Trapper Trails Council of the Boy Scouts of America. He received his bachelor's degree with honors from Utah State University and his law degree from the University of Utah. He's been admitted to practice law in Utah, the U.S. District Court, District of Utah the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Court of Appeals, 10th Circuit. Hilliard is a member of the Cache County and American Bar Associations, the Utah State Bar, and the American Board of Trial Advocates. He also speaks Dutch. Katie Wright is a professional in the nonprofit sector with a focus on connecting human and financial capital to challenges such as climate change and democracy reform. As executive director of Better Boundaries, she is charged with supporting Utah's nascent independent redistricting commission and working with the state's legislatures to adopt maps to give all Utahns fair representation. From 2008 to 2021, Katie led Park City Community Foundation as its executive director and its programs director. During that time, the Community Foundation tackled critical issues such as early childhood education, mental wellness, climate change, and equity and inclusion. Under her leadership, the Community Foundation was recognized as one of the nation's fastest growing community foundations, greatly expanding its grant making and community investments, while also growing total assets under management and an endowment to secure enduring change. Katie is a returned Peace Corps volunteer, Morocco, 2005 to 2007, and received a master's in public administration from Rutgers University and a BA from Colorado College. A deep love for nature and winter brought Katie to the Mountain West at age 18. She loves to ski, mountain bike, hike, and camp in the mountains and deserts of Utah with her spouse, Brian, and two children, Nora and Thea. So as you can all see, we have an esteemed panel here who um, know a lot about Utah and what uh, makes Utah so lovable and a, a, a history of service. So thank you so much for being here. We are so excited to hear what you can share with us. And with that being said, I'd just like to jump right into the first question. And I think um, what we'll do is we will go in order, um, starting with um, Executive Director Haight, and um, just in the order that I introduced you, then um, Ms. Hale, Mr. Hilliard, and Katie, and then we'll rotate through. So it won't be the same pe people every time. And um, the first question that we wanted to ask that our members really care about is just asking all four of you, where are we in the redistricting process? And so we'll start with you, Gordon. Okay, and I'll try to make mine brief because um, Karen and Lyle are the ones really in the, the heat of it. But right now we are, drawing maps. We've received a lot of public input and so we are seeing commissioners coming in generally starting about 10 o'clock in the morning and leaving about eight o'clock at night and um, coming in and then on the weekends they travel and do public hearings. So right now we're we're making maps and that's probably the short answer for the whole thing. I'll pass it on. Okay. Um, may I call you Karen? Is that okay? Yes, you Karen. may. Okay. Um, well, as Gordon said, we are making maps, uh, but I'd like to just add to that, that we are drawing maps with input from the public. And it's it's been wonderful. We've had a few public outreach meetings so far, and we'll be heading out again this week um, for Washington in um, down near St. George. We'll be going to Cedar City, where we'll be getting more input from residents uh, to let us know what they think their communities of interest are and how they would like to see maps drawn. We're getting a lot of information um, on our website. People are sending maps in, people are uh, writing to us and letting us know what they think their communities of interest are. So we are busily drawing maps, but we're doing that with the information that is being provided by, by residents. And it's really helpful. Uh, before we went on our um, public outreach, uh, to our public outreach meetings a few weeks ago, 
Um, we have been drawing some maps without much input at first, but we wanted to take some maps so that we could have people poke holes in, in them. Mm -hmm. You know, to say, we really love this, but we don't like this. So it's it's been um, wonderful to hear people's input and wonderful to get that public direction. I'll send it over to Commissioner Hilliard. Awesome. Well, thank, you. <clears throat> thank you. I'll add two other things that are, I think, really unique to us is I, I work with Judge Thorne. He's another member of the commission. And they we were asked by our leadership, just made that assignment. Uh, Karen or Commissioner Hale works with uh, Commissioner Facer. And so Commissioner Thorne and I meet for that 10 to eight, and we've done it probably 15 days. I'm trying to remember how we've done it, done a lot. And we then draft a, a congressional map. And then we, and we've done, I think seven of those We've drawn uh, two Senate maps. Uh, we just finished our second House map. I think we've got three State Board maps that Judge Thorne and I have put together in working through. They're not final. Uh, it's, it's really frustrating to me because I have no idea, for example, Orem. So if I move a line from second to third, and I have no idea how that really works on the ground. So it is vitally important that we hear from people who look at them and say, you missed this, you missed that. So I think that's really an important thing. We've been working hard on that. And the second thing is our drafting are all recorded. You can get on the internet and you can see the dumb things I said and how, and, and again, uh, it's really to give you the openness. Uh, there's no politics being discussed about it at all. In fact, we don't even know uh, what the political voting is in these areas we're dealing with. We are not given that. We do not want that. Uh, we made a choice that we don't even know, want, want to know where the incumbents live. Mm -hmm. So we may have some districts that put uh, three Democrat senators on the same district, and uh, we have no intent of doing that. We're just drying as we look at those lines. But the, the, the thing that we have to be very careful of is whatever we do will be recommended to the legislature. And the legislature is going to have to approve it. So I think there's going to have to be some looking at that to make sure that we don't end up with 50 members of the House all in, in isolated districts that will never approve what we're doing. Because where we draw lines are really based more on numbers than anything else. Thank goodness uh, our legal experts tell us we don't have enough of a minority issue that we have to do minority and other kinds of districts. We're where the minorities are in our state seem to have a, a basis of representing, electing people to represent them. But we haven't finalized that yet, and we're all in the process. But I agree with what Commissioner Hale said. It's vitally important that people come to meetings and give us suggestions. I went to the legislative meeting, and I was really quite disappointed. They didn't have any maps. They just took public input. We have maps, so people can look it up and say, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. But we can get, and give us suggestions of how we ought to change it. Thanks. Nice, wonderful. And uh, go ahead. Let's hear from Better Boundaries. Um, well, first, I put the link, uh, the YouTube link, but first I put the wrong link. So there's an article about St. George and redistricting there if you're interested. But the next link is the YouTube link. Um, so at Better Boundaries, our focus is having maps that meet the criteria as set up by statute, and that's what the Independent Commission is working so hard on. And then, of course, um, compelling the legislators to adopt those maps, because we know that the criteria um, reduces the impact of gerrymandering, which is harmful to democracy and what we believe in. So for us, um, our focus right now has shifted from encouraging everyone statewide to submit community of interest maps. That's still important, but as the commissioners have said, there are now draft maps to respond to. So we are doing phone banking and other efforts to encourage people to attend commission meetings and give feedback on the maps. We um, think the world of the commissioners, they are, have deep, deep experience as you've seen listening to their biographies and they're working incredibly diligent and they have smart staff supporting them. And so we wanna make sure that legislators and all Utahns know how um, the integrity of their process and effort and how critical it is that we participate as Utahns and that then the legislators adopt it. So we're focused on that grassroots organizing. And then of course, um, some of our efforts are around lobbying legislators. So we're watching and 
and observing the legislative committee meetings as well as um, speaking directly with um, state lawmakers. Great, thanks to all four of you. Um, our next question that we have is to ask all four of you, what are your thoughts about the actual map making process? And we, you've told us you're doing it, but we'd love your, your just initial thoughts about what that's like and, and really um, want to get a sense of how it's going and also what you would like citizens to consider when um, about how they think about your process that you're going through and what you have to balance and also what they should consider if they do decide to submit their own maps, even though we're now in a response uh, place. So I'd like to start with you, Commissioner Hale. Thank you. Well, that's a great question. And I will just say straight up, um, drawing maps is not as easy as you might think it is. And, you know, we started, um, we started with congressional maps and, um, and they were challenging, but, you know, four districts is a lot different um, than 75 districts for a house map. Uh, so, so we kind of worked up to things. We started with the congressional map we went to the state school districts, then we went to the state Senate districts and then uh, to the house. And it really is, um, there are a lot of things that you need to be aware of as you're drawing a map. So anybody who's, who's going to attempt that, um, you know, the, the word is you just need to make sure that um, you're aware of what the deviations are, you're aware of what, you know, the Voting Rights Act requires, what the constitution requires, what, you know, what criteria we as a, Commission has set for ourselves, um, and and we've been striving to follow all of these different things while we are, while we're drawing our maps. And so, like I say, it's really challenging. Um, you need to meet certain numbers. You know, for a congressional map, there needs to be eight hundred seventeen thousand nine hundred four people in each of those congressional districts, with a very very low deviation of less than eight hundred seventeen people per district. Um, and then when we get into the state Senate, it's 112,814. Um, when we get to the state house, it's 43,000. And when we get to the state school board, it's 218,108 people. And so you need to be aware of those numbers and there can be a slight deviation, but you don't wanna go too far. You don't wanna jeopardize, you know, what we all uh, love and embrace as one person, one vote. So, um, so we need to, you know, really watch those numbers carefully. And then we want to be aware of the criteria, the additional criteria that we have set for ourselves. We do want to keep those communities of interest together. Uh, Commissioner Hillier talked a little bit about um, different communities, different minority communities. And, and what we've done is we, we have a heat map where we are looking at those communities or we are looking at um, different areas where we know that there's a neighborhood that is set you know in in a certain position and, and when we have moved in to get some numbers all of a sudden we recognize that we've split a neighborhood up and we don't want to do that so we're really looking at those communities of interest we're looking to make our districts compact we're looking to you know follow geographic or man-made boundaries <laughs> that make it really easy for people to know where those boundaries are and they can easily identify um, the area in which they're represented you know, we have other criteria that I'll let others talk about, but, but there is a lot to keep in mind while we're drawing those maps. And so it's, it's not as easy as you might think it is. It's challenging, um, but it, it's a good process though, and it, it takes time. Wonderful. I'd say two things that I've learned in doing this is first of all, how the population has moved. For example, as you look at the Syracuse area in Davis County, you look at the uh, areas in, in Harriman and that area of, of Salt Lake County, you look at Eagle Mountain, that area of Utah County, and you go down to St. George, those areas have been really growing. And as I looked at, as we tried to put the House and Senate districts through for Salt Lake County, for example, I could see that the population in the north part of Salt Lake County has not kept up with the state growth. So they're gonna have to have bigger Senate seat, seats there to, to get the population you need. The other thing I've learned is that you have to put the whole thing together. So uh, for example, we met in Summit County and heard their request to have Summit County all in one district and, and Judge Thorne and I worked pretty hard on that, but it's very difficult because just north of Summit County 
is Rich County and and Morgan County, and now how they're not big enough to be their own districts. How do you tie them? How does that fit across the whole state? So it's like a jigsaw puzzle. We found Judge Thorne and I that if we do the outside first and then work on the inside, it works out really a lot better. But the the driving thing is numbers, and and you you talk about that. You can you can only have an eight hundred in an eighty. 817,000 plus, you've got to be within that number by no more than 800, either up or down. But if you're down in it, you've got to make it up in another district because when we get all done, we've got to have everybody in the state in one of these four districts. So you can't be down in three and then make it up on four and that puts them out of, out of balance. So that's why we end up drawing lines down streets and, and other areas to, to do that because one man, one vote. It becomes very, very difficult to put it down on paper and then see how it applies to lives. Thank you, uh, Katie. What do you? What would you like to add? Well, I'm, you know, not drawing maps except for just to, you know, experience it. But maybe what I'll share is some of the differences between the commission process and the legislative committee process. I think one thing to point out is the data that's being used while drawing maps, where as, um, as one of the commissioners mentioned earlier, they have asked not to see any political data. So that's not informing their decision-making and they're really focused on keeping communities intact, cities and counties, communities of interest. On the legislative committee side, they um, are very much looking at incumbents and feel that since they know that, the public should know that as well. But as they're being presented maps, um, you know, the first question out of a committee member, of course, is, OK, well, go, get to the part of the state that has my district and let me see what you've done with my city or town. So that creates a very different dialogue um, in the public hearings. And then the additional difference I want to point out is that um, Whereas the commission will think about communities of interest in terms of maybe people with a shared language or culture or people of color, um, that is not data, again, that the legislative committee is using. No one can use it as the, you know, I think the legal terminology is the pr primary principle reason for drawing a line, but, um, but it can be used among consideration, but the legislative committee has made the decision to not look at, it, at that data at all. Um, and then the final thing I'll say is that because the independent commissioners have been hard at work drawing maps for weeks now, they have a very practical knowledge of where it gets stuck. And so in the public hearings, the conversation in my mind is very constructive around the needs of those communities and the realities of population size um, because they have that tangible experience. So it's really great to see how that you know, time in the seat drawing map then lends to really productive dialogue in the public hearings. Thanks. Um, Gordon, do you want to add anything yeah. to that? Yeah, just a couple quick thoughts, sure. just to help people know that there's been questions about how the maps are being drawn and what the, the commission has done is they've divided up into three teams as um, Karen and Lyle have, uh, the commissioners had mentioned. So we have a Republican or Democrat always together working on the map. So it's it it does a lot to kind of you see a lot of camaraderie among the teams trying to really work together really well. And it um, it it's hastening the work. They're actually getting a lot of maps produced. And so that's that's been really kind of fun to see. And it's it's added to the transparency of of what's going on. The, the other thing I wanted to kind of just talk about just briefly is and, and hit what Katie was talking about, is lines do make a different difference. Uh, when you put a line through uh, a neighborhood, it weakens that neighborhood or that community's ability to be represented or have somebody um, elected out of their community. We've seen communities that have been split three or four times and, per, and statistically no one from that community will be able to be elected out of it just because they have to go to other communities where they're not familiar to be elected. And and there's still going to be communities split. It, it has to be because you're working with the numbers, but it's being done in a way that's transparent. The public's going to see exactly why that, that line was split, what was 
what was going into the thought process of the commissioners to do that. So I think that very open aspect um, allows the public to have confidence that they're seeing maps produced that are the people's maps, the input that they're getting. It's a, um, that's what's driving each of the decisions and you can hear what what's making the commissioners decide certain things. And it's uh, uh, it's maybe not as exciting as some of the football games are this weekend, but it's it's worth, I think, from a democratic process to, to strengthen your belief in the democratic process, it's good to watch this, just to see a portion of this and how this actually is done. Because a lot of times government will produce things from at, back in a room and they show it to you and say, this is it. And you don't know the motivation or the reasons and the public really wants to have that. And so I think process is extraordinarily important in this because there's not just one perfect map. There's a lot of ways it could work and a lot of ways it could be done, but why did you do it? And that I think really is going to sell the process. Well, I, I can say, I, I think it feels good to hear about this, to hear about this openness. It's kind of, it is inspiring. It feels great to hear about it. So thanks for sharing that. Um, Next up, our next question is um, kind of along those lines. Um, we'd like to know what you think, what each of you see as the challenges, and you've touched on a little bit, but maybe if you can dive a little deeper and surface some of the issues that you've been hearing about and talk to us about the challenges and the opportunities around protecting communities of interest and also ensuring that notion of fair representation, one person, one vote. What, what is that like? And could you please start, Commissioner Hilliard? Thank you. Uh, I like that question. Let me tell you, my biggest frustration is that we're driven so much by numbers. And when we talk about all of our criteria we have to put in place, numbers are objective. We can count 187,000 or 17,000, whatever the number is. So that becomes really paramount as we're putting groups together. I have a harder time on what is community of interest. It's interesting, the number, a number of people have talked to me about community of interest and they put it in political terms, that these are the Democrats, we need a, somebody in Congress. And I say, whoa, 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 that's gerrymandering. We can't look at Democrats or Republicans, we're to look at numbers. And so some of the criteria we have are really pretty, pretty subjective. So I think the number one, the main frustration let me share an idea that Judge Thorne and I worked on. We sat down to do school boards and we said there are 41 school districts. Every county in the state of Utah has a school district. Some counties have more than one. For example, Cache County has Logan and Cache, Weber and Ogden. Davis is just one. And so we said, let's make 15 uh, school boards using basis of, of the local school districts in there. Nightmare in Utah County. There are three school districts, Nebo, uh, uh, Provo, and Alpine. And both Nebo and Alpine are big enough that they can't have just one. They, they got to break that up some way. And how do you tie Provo into that? So that's the frustration. The numbers, uh, I wish I could just sit down and say, nah, we think Nebo and Alpine are the same. Uh, it was interesting in San, Pete, in, in, uh, excuse me, San Juan County, they said, let's go back to the old way and have one senator per county. <laughs> and I said, well, that changed in 1962. We can't do that anymore. But, but it's really frustrating to try to get communities of interest, for example, all the Alpine School District, to put in one school board because they're too big. And put Provo, they would say they're a community of interest for education, but they're too small. So they have to join with other people. And that, that's really the kind of frustration to my mind and is what really is community of interest? How big is it? How does it tie in? And that's my frustration. But I've learned a lot from it. I've, I think uh, I better understand the state of Utah now than I did before. And I think I had a pretty good knowledge of it. Thank you. Uh, Katie, what, what would you add? Um, so can you remind me, the question is about what are, what are the challenges or frustrations? Sure. Yeah, and thinking of communities of interest and also this notion of representation, um, fair representation. Yeah, I think, um, I think one of the challenges in communities of interest is certainly um, 
it's a very individual perspective. And so not all communities are going to agree on how a community of interest is defined. On the other side, I want to give a lot of credit again to the independent commission that is really bringing um, some innovative solutions to these challenges. So they're figuring out how to take all that community of interest input and overlay it just like a data set. So people can see someone like me who maybe like Lyle isn't familiar with Orem can look and say, well, what do people from Orem think about Orem? And I think that's an example of um, really creative and using technology to help the process. Um, in terms of you know, big picture frustration, frustration with redistricting, especially with a group like the League of Women Voters who are so steeped in you know, democracy and re democracy reform. And um, I think that technology, like almost every aspect of our life is both a savior and an incredible challenge. So we know that technology enabled really precise gerrymandering, gerrymandering as this country has never seen before. And that's obviously frustrating and not good for democracy. On the other hand, I'm completely buoyed and excited by the availability of um, websites like Princeton Gerrymandering, Plan Score, Dave's Redistricting that is democratizing the data available to regular citizens to look at maps and see what those maps are doing and how those maps might be biased or, um, or really good at keeping communities together. So I guess I, I would say um, in terms of things that are frustration and challenge, I think technology is something that's going to make among all other things, this redistricting process different than any other previous one. And, and that, can, that can be quite exciting as well. Thanks. Um, Gordon, what, what would you like to add? Okay, and, and I think the question on um, communities of interest is, is a difficult and a very challenging, but I think as we've talked about, as the commission has talked about it, they came up with some really, I'd say unique and clever ways of, of addressing it. And and let me just tell you a couple examples, but there was a whole lot of things. One of the things they talked about was like rural Utah. It's a, it's a community of interest. You have areas in the South where it's more of a um, tourist. You ha they have different issues and problems. And again, all of rural Utah, you know, we hear the reports of how they're struggling economically and having different issues. And then you go to, to eastern Utah and rural eastern Utah, and you have um, issues associated with them that have to do with mineral extraction and other kinds of, 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 and then northern Utah is more agriculture. And so each one of them have a real unique interest about how policies go, how money is spent and, and laws are worked out and they need their voice. And it's not just there, but you have suburban areas that are fast growing. The infrastructure is a big deal. You have suburban areas where you have a need for redevelopment. And each one of these have to have a voice. Otherwise, you go a decade without getting um, an opportunity to solve a number of issues that each of these have had. And so um, the commission, like they, like they said, it's very difficult to put your finger on what is a community of interest. You know one when you see one, I guess, but it's it's trying to do that. And one of the things that the commission is extraordinarily sensitive to is looking at city boundaries. Um, and, and that makes a lot of sense because of how zoning is and how communities are, people gather in, in certain ways to, and we've heard that from cities. In fact, it's almost been universal, the comment from cities saying, don't split us apart, those that can be held together or, and, and some do have to be just because they're so large, but that, that I think is key to help representation in some of these communities. And I've watched the commission really struggle to try, you know, they're battling things about compactness and other things. And some of these cities are not compact. The cities are gerrymandered. And so they're trying to um, do their best to allow neighborhoods to stay together and, and looking at school districts and all those kinds of things, like they said. So that's my comment on that. Super helpful. Uh, Karen, would you wrap us up? Gordon's comment on, on cities and, and their boundaries made me think of, of a great challenge that we as commissioners have. Um, I, I said to uh, 
Commissioner Facer the other day, we need to make sure that people know that we're not the ones who are drawing the city boundaries because we have seen some really crazy city boundaries and we're not responsible for those at all. So, um, so anyway, you know, just working within those boundaries and we really have tried to be conscious of those city boundaries because we do want to, as much as possible, keep those cities together. And I think the challenge is um, being responsive to the needs of those communities, to the municipalities, being responsive um, to the other needs that are identified by residents throughout the state. Um, a lot of the uh, communication we received this week was um, about rural versus urban. And, and I think a challenge um, for us all is just reminding us that we have this number thing that, that Commissioner Hilliard spoke about. And it is really great to keep those rural areas together and we're trying to do that as much as we can. But we have several counties that if we pair even four counties together, they still do not, um, the numbers don't combine to make one district. So we have to bring in some kind of center of population. Um, so some kind of urban element into that where there is some population that we can bring in to, um, to achieve the numbers that we are required to achieve. So I think that, that piece right there is a big challenge. But while we're, talk while we're talking about challenges, I just want to um, comment on the great opportunities that we have. And, and I know that um, Katie talked a little bit about just the amazing technology just the ability that we have with GIS. We can be looking at these maps and we can do an overlay with a, um, you know, a, a map, a, a Google map on top. So we can see, are we breaking up this neighborhood? Is that a mountain range we're looking at? Is that the bluff in St. George? Um, you know, just these amazing things that we can do with technology. And we've really been lucky uh, to have GIS specialists from throughout the state who um, have, volunteered their time to come sit with us as we map and to help, you know, do all of the technical um, um, designations uh, while we're doing these maps and, you know, just sharing their expertise with us. And it, it really has been a gift for us. So I'm quite appreciative of the technology and the, the ability that we have to even see these communities um, closely. So thank you. Oh, thank you. All right, so now it's our last prepared question from that we prepared in advance. And um, this one we'll ask uh, Katie Wright from Better Boundaries to start us off with, and then we'll ask everyone else to also chime in. And it's this one, how can citizens best influence the process? What is the most important thing we can do to ensure that the legislature really listens to citizen voices? Yeah, I think there are two really important actions. The first is to engage with the independent commission to um, give feedback on the maps so that all that time and effort they're putting in to draw lines really is as successful and meets the criteria as much as possible. And that has a secondary impact where it really demonstrates how much Utahans are engaged and care about a fair um, nonpartisan process. And then the second most important action is to be in touch with your state lawmakers and let them know how much you value the independent process and how important it is that they adopt the independent commission maps. Um, and those are the two, I think, most important actions. And then because you are the League of Women Voters and you all love to go above and beyond, the B Better Boundaries is of course looking for volunteers to help us phone bank and share those two really important actions with other people across the state. Awesome, thank you. Um, Mr. Haight, Gordon. Sorry okay. about that. No what I think it, it's important to understand that this, the technology is fantastic, like has been mentioned, but it can also be intimidating to residents and to people out there. And, and it can be hard to produce a map. It, it, just to do um, a state house map takes three or four days and, and that's rigorous days after you know the software and you have people working with you and we put a lot of treats with sugar in front of the commission to keep up their, their energy and blood sugar up that they're gonna to have to go through a detox after this process. But 
we, 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 we know that people are experts in their community. They may not be able to draw maps about it, but they can tell us about it. And I think that is really key is we want these to be the people's maps. And I think that that's the, you know, if we get people involved understanding that because it is such an important step, it's going to determine how elections are gonna be, where people get elected from for the next decade. And it's really going to help steer policies and the spending for the state. So, so that's that we feel is really important. And from our standpoint, one of the things we're doing with the maps, and we've talked to Katie quite a bit about it, is we're going to make sure these are high quality maps. We're going through a very rigorous QC of these maps in terms of, of all the different criteria of how many splits there are of communities and how um, the votes are done and everything looking at these things. We're using um, Princeton gerrymandering to do a QC of each map that comes through so that, so not only is the process really transparent and clear and visible with the right criteria, the maps will also be of the highest quality. There are currently, we've submitted all of the school district maps to the school superintendent who's sending it to all the different school districts. So they comment on how they feel so that we're not splitting up. Um, if you have three, four elementaries that feed to two junior highs that feed to a high school, you don't wanna split that up. You want that all represented by one school board member. We're also sending the maps to the state uh, election authority and they're sending it to the county clerks to verify that the maps are functional at the end so that we know that we don't create a three person district by the way some counties trying to make the maps we produced work. So we're looking at every aspect, the mechanics of them, how they work for each group that's going to have to um, work with them. And so that's kind of the, the process I see. So. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Karen Hill. Thank you. Well, I would just echo uh, the words of, of Katie and Gordon. Um, you know, I think just the importance of being engaged, recognizing that, you know, this, um, this independent uh, redistricting commission is in place because the people of the state of Utah wanted, wanted there to be an independent commission. And I think for us to, to remember that and to think that it's upon all of us now to be engaged and to give input to, uh, to those maps. You know, it was really interesting. Um, we were in Heber uh, City a week and a half ago and people were commenting on how they wanted their community to be linked with others or not linked with others. And um, it was just really interesting conversation. And I must say, I have to just on the side, people were so civil and respectful of each other. There were different views that were expressed and everybody was applauding each other. And it was really quite a lovely meeting. Um, but as we listened to the input that was given, uh, you know, we took notes, we were very conscious of what people were saying. And as we went back um, the week after and we're working on specific maps, when we got to Summit County, those comments were just fresh in our minds. And we were able to say, okay, you know, remember, they said to include hideout with Park City or you know, to, to bring Oakley into um, this piece as well. And you know, it was just so great to have that input. And as Gordon said, I think all of us can be intimidated. I can be intimidated by doing a whole state map, a state Senate map or a house district map. But if you're intimidated to do that, don't despair. You can be of great help by giving us the information about your community. As Gordon said, the, you know, share the information you have about your community of interest and give us some, some input that will inform the way we draw these maps. And that way we can go with great confidence to the legislature on November 1st and say, we have some maps that we feel are high quality and we feel that they have really been informed by the people throughout the state of Utah. Thanks. My, my suggestion to anyone who wants to help us is number one, remember population. So when you send me a map that ends up population way out, there's not a lot we can do with it. Number two, remember uh, compactness and try to keep them together. And number three, if you don't like the maps we do and you wanna make a change, 
don't just change that one area, but remember, whatever you take away from one, you have to put back in another and balance and do that. Now, I agree with what Commissioner Hale said. It can be intimidating. We spent many hours just doing a, a, a house map. And I think we've had to be trained to do this. It's, it's not that easy. But so if you're gonna talk about communities of interest, you don't need to worry so much about lines. You can say, for example, that we think this school district and this school district are very compatible and should have the same, the same person. But if you're gonna draw lines, remember the numbers really make a difference. Number two, you have to do the whole state. You can't do just one little portion of it. Number three, if you're going to change the line of, than one of, that we've suggested, have an alternative so that it balances out because you can't put Logan, I've got that request, but Logan in one house district, it's too big. You get this too much population, can't do it. Interesting. Well, great. Thank you very much. And that those were our four plan questions. And I really appreciate your attentiveness to them and really answering them. And now I'm going to invite um, Donnie Davis, our uh, program director, um, to go ahead and share with us some of the questions we're receiving from the audience. Donnie? Well, thank you, Shauna. The questions that we have from our attendees so far. The first one from Kathy Bealey. Can you tell us if you're receiving any comments in favor of a rural urban mix of congressional districts? How would that relate to a community of interest? And I know Karen touched on that um, a, a bit, but maybe you can all expound on that. The rural urban mix. And I'm thinking maybe we should just keep our same tradition, you know, at least, you know, going in if you if you choose not to answer it, it's okay, but let's just go in the same rotation and that would mean starting with um, Gordon Haight. Um, I think there, there have been questions, pizza and donut and all those kinds of things. I think the you're going to have to have roll tied into uh, the urban areas just so you can keep the population, but how it's done, there are 12 maps right now on the website that have been drawn. And I think there's a map that everybody can find personally that they'll hate and personally that they'll like. And I think one of the things they can do is tell us which one they hate and which one they like and why they hate it and why they like it. And, um, and, and I think that's my recommendation. <laughs> tell us, because they're done, they're ready. So we, we need the comments today. And, and uh, by the end of the month, we're gonna pare it down to three. That's my hope. I, well, Karen and Lyle can weigh on that more, but they, they want some input. Tell us which ones you like and don't like. Awesome. Go ahead, Karen. Yes, we have had a lot of uh, input on rural districts, uh, urban districts for our congressional districts. And, and um, it was interesting reading the comments that came in this past week, a lot of people saying, you know, please just let Salt Lake County be its own district. Well, we can't do that as Commissioner Hilliard and others have explained today, just by sheer numbers, we can't do that. Uh, Salt Lake County is over 1.1 million people and a congressional district is 817,000. So there has to be a split some way. And, um, but I think there are some, some really great um, attempts at trying to address those requests and those um, areas of interest. And I have to say, there are some really good maps. Like Gordon said, there may be one that you really love and one that you may not like, but, um, but I see some really good districts that have been drawn. So I, I, I really want you to go uh, to the website, look at those maps or come to, the, uh, come to our public hearings and and share your um, your input on those maps. Um, I Because I think there are ways that we can address those concerns. The interesting thing to me is some of the comments we're hearing from rural is they want the four congressional districts, two to be rural and two to be urban. <laughs> you say, wait, you can't do that. Uh, I think if you look at one of the maps that, I, that, that Judge Thorne and I did, I think it's the orange number two. I In working in that, we tried to take Weber County and North into a, a congressional district, Davis County and then into Salt Lake County and some West 
we took the rest of Salt Lake County and and put one group one group going through Utah County down to St. George, the other one going through down to Kane County. Now the problem got to be is that the one on north you make that rural, but they'd have to go all the way from Snowville to uh, Blandy, and also probably pick up uh, in the area of St. George and, and Vernal because the rurals are so scattered. And so you can create a district like that and, and, and the numbers just really work hard for you. But that's it. That's when I felt very comfortable about uh, it. We ended up three, uh, instead of just two in Salt Lake County, three. But one thing that was amazing to me is you don't have to live in your congressional district to run for that office. Jason Chaffetz did not live in his district. Jim Matheson did not live in his district. Ben McAdams did not live in his district. And right now, Blake Moore does not live in District 1. And so when people look at those, and again, I hear somebody say, put Salt Lake City in one. I don't know the population of Salt Lake City. I've used the figure all the time at 200,000. That wouldn't even make a fourth of a district if you took Salt Lake County, City, excuse me, Salt Lake City itself and tried to create a congressional district. It wouldn't even be a fourth of what it needs to be. So there's going to be some mixture, especially in these big uh, congressional districts. That uh, and I'd like to say this: I want a representative in my Congress who's not from Ogden, who's not from Provo, and not representing Salt Lake or, or rural. I want someone who represents Utah. And I think our issues I've found over the years are so related to each other. Salt Lake does not do well if Vernal is suffering. And the same thing, St. George doesn't do well if there's problems in Provo. And we, we're, we as a state, although we're highly urbanized but the way we live, we are all really dependent upon each other. And I think it's important that we have people serving us wherever they may be with a view of representing the whole state of Utah and not just the ge geographical area that I represent. Um, so the question I think was about, um, do, are, are, are there a lot of public comments favoring the rural urban mix for congressional districts? And while I will say that there are certainly people who share what Lyle, you know, the viewpoint that Lyle has just shared, I do think it's the minority, and I'm thinking of both the Legislative Redistricting Committee and the Independent Commission and the feedback. What you most often hear is, don't dilute my voice. Um, and I think that's a fear whether or not you live in an urban area or in a rural area. Um, but you do hear an argument for mixing it. Um, the counter argument you'll hear is that's why we elect senators at large, so we have a balance, you know, congressional or how the house is meant to be a regional um, and Senate is meant to be at large and that uh, allows us to achieve balance in our federal representation. So honestly, I would say the conversation is an ongoing dialogue and debate, um, but my impression is that most people say, don't dilute my voice, whether that means don't dilute my rural voice with urban or don't dilute my urban voice with rural. And as one of our board members at Better Boundaries likes to point out, actually six out of 10 Utahns live in suburbia. So <laughs> we should probably add them as a, as a voice that also needs to be, you know, maybe kept in a community of interest. Anybody want to say anything else about that? Okay, let's have the next one, Donnie. Okay, and just a reminder to our attendees, if you'd like to enter a question into the Q&A. Um, the next question is from Mark, Mark Rothatcher. What confidence can we have that the Utah legislature dominated by Republicans won't throw away our maps and draw their own map to help them continue their power in their power? This is what happened 10 years ago. Um, so Commissioner Hill, you're up for that. I don't know if you want to start off with anybody, <laughs> lucky, lucky. Right. Well, you know, I've had the great advantage of serving the legislature for 40 years, and I've been through four reapportionments, and I've never been a member of the committee. And I've been asked several times by leadership to serve on it, and I've always been too busy because I know how much time it takes to do it. So now that I'm out of the legislature, when President Adams called and asked me to do this, I said, sure, I'll take the time to do it and, and do it. 
I really think that ger gerrymandering is in the eyes of the beholder. And I say that in this way, uh, again, I saw an email from somebody here in Logan said the fact that we put Logan in three house districts means it's gerrymandering and the Republicans control these three seats. Well, let me tell you, as a Senator, I represented all of Logan. I never saw uh, more than more than 30% vote for Democrats in any of my voting districts. And I think you could have drawn the lines anywhere you wanted. So, but for that person, they felt the legislature by putting three districts in, Lo uh, in Logan, they had to because Logan, they could have made it two, but Logan was too big for just one house district. And, and again, the view is, well, that would have changed and we could have elected the Democrat, certainly not true in Logan. Now, I don't know about the other areas because I have really not been involved with them. But I know as I'm putting these lines together, the constitution says the legislature will draw the lines. So, uh, you know, they have to listen or whatever they want, but they make the final decision because house members are elected every two years, senators every four years. And if you don't like what they've done, elect somebody new. So what I always say, I think we're, again, we're not looking at politics, but I can guarantee you that when we're done, somebody with the geographical political information is going to look at our maps and say, there, see, he did it. He gerrymandered, gerrymandered that area so the Republicans could win. And when you have over, what, 600,000 registered Republicans and less than 200,000 registered Democrats, it's kind of hard unless I do what some people say, take this area and then guarantee the Democrats will have an area. That's, that's gerrymandering. And uh, so I, 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 think, I think my view of watching the legislative process, there's more concerns about the incumbents, be it D Democrats or Republicans, I think they work more together because usually the maps that are passed pass unanimously by both bodies. So I, I, I Senator, uh, Senator Hale, Karen, she was on the minority party too. I don't know whether she felt that there was district and I don't know about Salt Lake. Salt Lake's a different animal than the rest of it. But I've, I've never felt in the rural areas that I'm familiar with that lines were ever drawn to give anyone a political advantage. It's just the way it is. Well, I think I'm up next. Uh, yeah, oh. Senator Hale, please jump in. Commissioner Hale. You're on oh, mute. Oh, you're now. on mute. Oh, thank you. I'll just respond to uh, Commissioner Hillier too. Um, you know, there were a lot of votes at the time that I was in the Senate where there was a lot of, um, there were a lot of unanimous votes. And I have to say the cycle um, that uh, in which, you know, I was in the legislature, uh, the redistricting cycle, I didn't see the unanimity, um, at least in, in my area. Um, and, I, and I do think there were, um, I think there were definitely some gerrymandered um, districts um, within, within my area uh, in Salt Lake County. And, um, and with that being said, I do hope that, um, and, and Commissioner Hilliard is right, you know, the constitution states that the legislature is responsible for that line drawing. And, you know, and we have an independent commission and I hope that the state, um, the people in the state recognize what the process is here and they see the independent commission as that, that we are independent, that we have rejected any kind of political information that is going to um, impact or inform the maps that we are producing and that we are going to take these maps, present them to the legislature um, with the hope and the expectation that that legislative committee um, will look objectively at the maps that, that we are submitting. And that again, as I said, they will not know that those maps have um, credit with the input of people throughout the state. And the exercise that, that they are going through now, that legislative committee, if they're doing any kind of map drawing now, um, I think you know, can be helpful because they know what goes into that and they understand the numbers. They understand, hopefully, um, even though uh, communities of interest may not be their criteria, but they'll have an understanding for that and have an understanding for what people want and what their expectations are 
um, for, you know, for lines that will affect all of us throughout the state for the next 10 years. So I'm, I'm hoping that the experience that the legislative committee um, is having is an educational experience <laughs> so that they will see and understand and know the work that the independent commission has gone through to submit the maps that are coming. So, um, so anyway, I'm, I want to be hopeful and I encourage everybody to have good dialogue with their legislators um, and to give the same kind of input and feedback um, to them as you're giving to us too. And if you share the expectation uh, that these maps will be considered, then let, let your legislators know. Thanks. Um, I, I would say I'm very optimistic that the maps that are adopted by our state lawmakers will have a substantial reduction in gerrymandering, but most importantly, more um, accurately, you know, reflect true representation here in the state. And here's why, I mean, first and foremost, I want to just acknowledge again, who's on the independent commission and who appointed them. So our lawmakers appoint, appointed people of stature, knowledge, experience, and expertise. And I think that's a nod to their um, taking this independent commission quite seriously. Um, secondly, the work of the commission is really of, of the highest caliber. As an example, um, their, their council has hired a professor, Nate Persley, who's known nationally as one of the number one mapping experts that you hire, not when you're working for the Republican Party and not when you're working for the Democrat Party because there's equal offenders nationally and locally, but when you wanna draw maps that achieve representation. So they have really solid expert advice. Um, my third uh, positive you know, forward momentum for this effort is the absolute engagement of Utahns. So we have had over, I think, 370 community of interest maps submitted um, just to better boundaries that we've handed over. And we're just at the beginning of this. I mean, the hearings and the commissions and the public input and the whole district drawing has just begun. Um, and finally, the dialogue of the community and even the dialogue at the legislative committee meetings is really centering around keeping communities intact. So it's been fascinating to me to listen to regular everyday Utahns who have drawn whole district maps. So first of all, they just impressed me, period, just with that. And the first question is, well, what was your goal when you drew this? And over and over again, you hear, well, I really thought about neighborhoods or how do I keep cities intact? Or how do I keep counties intact? Or how do you keep communities of interest? So the language that we're using has already moved forward in a very positive way. So I'm optimistic. And, and I'll just add a couple thoughts to it. One is I mentioned earlier, these maps are gonna be super high quality. They're gonna be checked and rechecked to a point that I think that the bar is gonna be extraordinarily high. And I think that's important. But the next thing that's really important it has a lot to do with the process. And, and, and we all kind of remember the riots we had last summer and then the attack on the Capitol in January. There's just a feeling throughout the country in Utah that it fix everybody, that people don't have a voice, that, there's, um, that they, they can't um, solve their issues through a democratic process. And so if they don't have a voice, they, they can't speak, they can't solve their problems. And so they spray paint on the Capitol wall. And we need to, to tell people that democracy works, that this is an opportunity to let people know it doesn't fix all the problems. We start to move the dial that lets people know that this is the first step. So you can have people from your community that are involved in the process that can bring real solutions to, to these things. So it's not just about maps, because like I said, you draw a map, you're weakening the community once you put that line. So you gotta be extraordinarily careful and you have to know the motivation for that line. And that's where the process and the transparency is absolutely critical if you're going to have democracy you can't do it in any other fashion and so i think through the process the caliper of the maps the need the absolute need for uh, people to feel like they have a voice and that they they can be represented and that democracy 
absolutely works. And these are the people's maps. I think that's that's a lot of reasons to um, to to see these maps get adopted um, to just change how that dialogue is. Okay. Any final thoughts from any of the four of you on this issue about the confidence that the legislature will listen and how to help make that happen? Okay, Donnie, what's the next one? All right. And our final question is so far is numbers can, this is by Kathy Adams, numbers can be manipulated. I had wondered why it was important that the citizens draw community of interest maps. However, I just listened to the Ohio Redistricting Committee hearing drawn by the Republican legislature. None of the Republicans on the commission bothered to be present at the hearing. The most compelling testimony, testimony was from longtime residents who were upset by the splitting of neighborhoods and could argue very specifically how the map was skewed toward the Republican Party. I would like to see how my neighborhood is split up. Or for an example, why my congressional district covers a huge part of the state that one representative could not possibly be attuned to my concerns about water and a rancher's concerns about water rights. I know the Harvard Yale area has four different districts in it. The legislative committee might assert that population is the best way to determine districts. While in fact, it can also be the way to keep the people in power that are already in power. Okay, let me see. Technically speaking, this one would be um, started um, by Commissioner Hillier, but since you started the last one, Commissioner Hill, do you wanna start this one? Do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, I, um, I, so is the question then, um, you know, how, how will my interests be represented? Yeah, it seems like maybe there's, maybe even if we took a step back and just help us understand why does it have to be by the numbers? And I, and you guys have said, uh, have explained that, but I think to just reiterate why the numbers are there and why that is the predominant um, issue, just to make sure everybody in the audience understands that. And then maybe with that, in, with that fact, how can we prevent things like having the Harvard Yale neighborhood having four different um, representatives? Right, so, so I think representation obviously um, is you know, the, the key and that's why numbers are so important is that um, but I think just basically people want to feel confident in the fact that they are equally represented. So there's not going to be, um, you know, one, one uh, district that has very few people and another that has a great number of people. And I, and I think, I, I guess what, what is really giving me um, encouragement in this process is looking at neighborhoods. Um, looking at keeping those neighborhoods, those communities of interest together. Um, if I lived in, you know, in the Harvard Yale neighborhood, I would be very frustrated that my, you know, that, that my community was split into four congressional districts. I, I don't think that there is a need for that. And as, as we have, you know, gone through this process and as, as um, the team, you know, the teams are working and as, our team has specifically really tried to look at communities of interest. I think there are ways that we can address that and be mindful as we draw maps. Um, because I think it is important that people feel like, um, like they are represented and that their community is represented, that their interests are represented. And so I'm, I'm encouraged by the emphasis that um, that we have seen uh, from the input that we've received from throughout the state and also the um, emphasis that we have, have put in communities of interest as we've been drawing maps. So, um, so I think there's hope to address that. And I think it is really discouraging for people. Um, you know, Gordon was talking about just the last year, year and a half 
of what we've all experienced um, in our own communities and throughout the nation. And I think one, one opportunity that we really do have through this redistricting process and through an independent commission is to give people hope that they can be engaged and that they can make a difference and that they can be represented. And so that's why I just keep pleading for people to be engaged in this process and, um, and give people that confidence um, that they need to have and that they want to have, that they are, that they are represented. Thanks. You want me to go next? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> or I'll defer. I, I would just make a couple of comments. Number one is the fact that this is time consuming. I have not been on any of these legislative committees because I knew how much time it took and how many trips they took around the state and looking and getting acquainted with it. So I don't think you really can compare what we do in Utah, what they do in Ohio. And I think Katie said it very well. This is an equal opportunity by both parties. Whoever's in majority is going to draw lines to favor their side. So I don't, it's not a Republican, it is a Republican issue here, but it's a Democratic issue in California or wherever you may be. So, but let me share with you one of the really things I have debated and struggled with as we're doing Senate and House maps in Salt Lake County. I know because of my work as in public education about the real differences in the public education uh, costs in west part of Salt Lake and the east part of Salt Lake. And I've always, str I struggle now, should I draw a house district that runs parallel to, to I-15 or should I do one that crosses it? You could argue, well, the community of interest would run parallel, but do you really want those people in their camp and the people on the east side of I-15 in their camp and, and not really understanding each other because you don't get anything done in the legislature as a single legislator. In the Senate, you gotta have 15 or 14 others vote with you. And I guess the comment when people say, well, I don't want it divided up. When I first got in the house, I was in leadership in the house and I had Rich County Garden City. Glenn Brown was also in leadership. He lived in Colville, he had Randolph. So Rich County had two legislators, both serving in house leadership. And somebody from Rich County came in and said, this is all wrong. We need to have, we need to elect somebody from Rich County. You need to make us a district. And I said, folks, you've got 1800 people. You're never gonna get a house district. It's how do you feel to have two serving in leadership working for you and helping you? And he said, oh, I never thought of that. And I think the same thing when Salt Lake City has a problem, if they only have one Congressman that can help them or maybe two, how much better it would be if they had four? If they knew all four of them said, hey, Salt Lake City is my important thing. I need to take care of Salt Lake City. How much more important is this? And especially in Congress where you don't have to live in your district. House and Senate seats, you have to, and school board, you have to live there. So I think that's important where those lines are, that you have people who can run and want to run. But I, I think it's viewed differently. And, and I think uh, when you get on my side of things, I honestly think uh, Karen Hale and I are good friends. We don't always vote the same on the floor of the Senate, but I think in this issue, I have no idea what she and, and Chairman Farr or, uh, Facer are doing. I don't think she has any idea what we're doing. We're gonna all get together and look at all these maps and see where we're in common and work out something before we make a recommendation. Uh, but I don't sense any, any politics in what we're doing. I think what we're doing is trying to meet this terrible burden of having equal population in every area which is a good theory, but it makes it really difficult when you have to then say, well, here's a line, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna to have to cut that line. And here's an area that probably really would like, would rather be in district two than one, but the numbers just don't balance out. Okay, thank you very much. That's really helpful. Now, um, I must wanna go like this to decide who goes last, but maybe, um, uh, I don't know, um, are, uh, Katie or Gordon, are either of you inspired to go next? Uh, um, go, thank you. I'll just be real brief. I think the numbers are important because you know the Supreme Court has ruled on it. It's something people can grab hold of. But if you let people drive first and then the numbers have to fit, I think it can give you an opportunity to be a little more thoughtful 
And, and I've seen that in the commission. And 100%, all three teams are thinking about that. And that, even though they talk about numbers, when you're in the room, and that's why I want you to watch the video, they're talking about people every time. They're talking about neighborhoods. And it, what what's, you do have a little bit of fluctuation, a deviance, deviation that you can work with. And there's some ideas that you want to get as small as you can. But in some cases, to get it that small, you just go find a neighborhood and chip away from it and split it up. Had you stayed within the deviation, you can maybe make things a little more because somebody walks outside their house and they realize the people across the street are voting for somebody different. And they say, really? Why'd that happen? And they're not, you know, we can explain things that oh, your neighborhood's so close. Aren't you happy that you got that one vote, one person? No, I'd rather vote with my neighbor. But those are things we're working on and that's it. Thank you. Okay, Katie, wrap us up. Yeah, I think what I'd say to this is if it was just about one person, one vote, you could put it in, it's a math problem and a computer could solve it for you. So certainly we all know that when districts are being drawn, there are other considerations. And, you know, I think it's become really clear through the good work and words of the commissioners and the executive director Haidt of how the other criteria of keeping communities, um, counties and cities intact considering and learning about communities of interest and doing your best to keep them intact really then gets to that art of representation. And so um, the numbers have to be followed, of course, within the variance, but that's a math problem. And everything else is, is about criteria and standards and what, what the line drawers are prioritizing. And, you know, the, the, people across Utahans voted for transparent and clear criteria that centers voters. And, and that's what this process is all about. And that's what they're doing and executing so well. And I guess I should add, and I, I really appreciate because I know the League of Women Voters were a huge workhorse and volunteers and strategic partner in mobilizing the state. So we're very grateful for your you know, dedication to these efforts. So thank you for that. Well, I just want to thank all of you, all of our panelists. Democracy is hard work and it is tricky and messy sometimes, but what a lovely example to have the four of you here educating us in a civil way and respecting um, our need to know and um, taking time out of your schedules to help us be more knowledgeable. Um, thank, thank you very, very much. And I also want to th say thank you to all the League members who participated in our meeting today and to the friends who joined us. Um, you're all very welcome, and we really appreciate your attention to this critical issue. I want to make sure that everyone on the call tonight knows that you are invited to our next general meeting of the League of Women Voters of Salt Lake next month, which is going to be on the topic of equal importance, which is ranked choice voting. And our speakers so far, we're going to have more, but so far we have Stan Lockhart and Colleen Potter from Utah Ranked Choice Voting. And that event is October 20th at 7 p.m., also on Zoom. And to register for that, oh, and I just got a note, uh, Sherry Swenson is also gonna be one of our um, panelists that night as well. So great, so we have three so far and that should be a great conversation. Again, if you wanna register for our next general meeting or find out about any future meetings or activities of the league, please check out our website. That is lwvsl.org. Again, lwvsl.org. And thank you so much and have a wonderful month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Take good care. Thank you. Thanks for all good your night. hard work. Okay.